Yes. Hey, Hills, it's great to be with you. Greetings from Bayside. It's a pl pleasure for us to be over here. You heard from my coworker, Jason Kane, uh, last week, and I'm here to clean up everything that he got wrong. And so we're gonna make it right. Uh, this week, we were led in worship by a guy from Austin, Texas. You're hearing a sermon from a guy from Arkansas. If, uh, if y'all aren't saying y'all by the time you leave here today, we have gone something horrifically wrong. Let me pastorally just add a moment to that idea of baptisms. Last night, at Bayside Granite Bay, we spontaneously baptized an 84-year-old woman. We were doing baptisms. Our pastor just said, hey, if you've never been baptized and, and you want to, we don't have anything, but good luck. And uh, she came up and she said, I never thought I would be able to do this. And uh, I thought, dear Lord, don't drop her. Whatever you do, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. But it was so meaningful. And so I can encourage you, if, if you're thinking about taking that next step, uh, go ahead and do so. If you have your Bibles, hope you do. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter four. As today, I have what I really feel like kind of is a back to school message. Uh, and I think it fits very well uh, to that idea. I, I, uh, last uh, Mother's Day, I released this book called Stay in Your Lane. Total coincidence that a book called Stay in Your Lane came out on Mother's Day. Total coincidence, uh, you know, the title was just a, a sheer accident, uh, but I brought a few copies with me today, so if this message speaks to you, it's a great way, uh, easy way to get it to your neighbor and, uh, and then also to your friend. But Proverbs chapter four is where we're going to be. Don't forget, the book of Proverbs now is written like a father now writing to a son. Don't get caught up in gender, but it is this idea of a parent now about to release a child out into the world. Maybe in their day, it would have been the age of 13. I think in our day, it'd be the age of 16. You're about to hand over the car keys to your child. My youngest, uh, Silas, is 16. And so he's about, he's doing the learner's permit and and if he passes his test, he, and if he's responsible, he's gonna get these car keys, he's about to launch out into the world. And so the father is now writing to the son in the book of Proverbs to say, here's how the world generally works. Now, and here are the things that can really get, get you in trouble if, you, if you're not very careful about, and then here are the ways you can uh, succeed and flourish. And so we're gonna look specifically at verse 26, but I want us to read verses 20 uh, through 27 to get the full context of what's going on. So Proverbs chapter four, let's start reading in verse number 20. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of their sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the past of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. If you're taking notes today, I hope that you are either in your head, on paper, not on your phone. But if you have a piece of paper, I want you to take that piece of paper. Now, I want you to make three columns. And so take whatever white space you have, go about a third of the way to over, draw a vertical line, go another third of the way over, draw another vertical line. If not, just get in your mind a, a vision of a white sheet of paper with two vertical lines spaced apart. And now we have three specific columns. And at the top of that first column, I want you to write the words, what's mine? Just the basic question, what's mine? We're gonna look at that. What does it mean? What is mine? What do I actually own? And in the middle column, I want you to write the question, what's theirs? What's theirs? T-H-E-I-R-S, what's, what's theirs? And then the last column, I want you to write the, the question, what's God's? So what's mine? What's theirs? What's God's? Uh, my grandfather is the one who taught me how to drive on the back roads of Arkansas, or what we call in Arkansas, the roads in, in Arkansas. And so and my grandfather is the one that taught me. I think that's a brilliant way to go about it. I, I, I watched my dad teach my sister, and I thought, I want no part of, of that relationship whatsoever. Uh, but when a grandfather teaches a grandchild, the grandchildren tend to be much more uh, caring and listening to the grandparent. The grandparent tends to be much more patient that, with the grandchild, and if it doesn't go well, the grandparents have lived long lives and so everything is good to go. So my grandfather's the one that taught me and I still have this distinct image in my head of being in his pickup truck, him holding on to the handle and he's terrified I'm about to drive it into the ditch and he is strongly encouraging me, just keep it between the double lines in the ditch. That was the extent of my driver's education in Arkansas. That's all you needed. Keep it between the double lines 
and the ditch. Well, three years ago, Jenny and I flew out here uh, to go through an interview process to think about moving here uh, to, to work at Bayside. And we landed at the airport, went out, rented a car, came out, got on the five. The five merged in the 80. I'm going six lanes of traffic one way. There's six lanes of traffic coming back the other way, concrete all around me. And I distinctly remember thinking to myself, there is no way I'm moving here. <laughs> so about a year later, after we had moved here, my... Um, my mom flew in to visit us, so I went out and picked her up, picked her up, got on the five, the five merged onto the 80. I'm now driving six lanes of traffic up toward Auburn where we live, six lanes of traffic coming back the other way. I'm going 85, 90, if my attorney is here, 75 miles an hour up the interstate. And she turns to me at one point and she goes, who have you become? You know what fascinates me about the interstate system, specifically that the interstate system in California? It's not when it breaks down. <clears throat> it's not when there's a traffic jam. It's not whatever happens in Vacaville every time you go through Vacaville. It, it, it's not the, the picture they give every Thanksgiving of downtown Los Angeles when it's just a, a standstill, a parking lot on Interstate 5. That doesn't surprise me. There, there's so many cars, so many people uh, trying to go so many places. It doesn't surprise me when it doesn't work. Here's what shocks me when it does. The uh, uh, amount of people that can move with a tremendous amount of speed and, and such unbelievable, almost reach out and touch your neighbor proximity and can do so without any real threat or, or fear of danger. It's, a, it, it's the speed at which I can move with the proximity to other people that I can move. It absolutely amaze me. And do you know what is the technology that enables all of that to work? It's paint on concrete. That's it. That, that as long as I stay in my lane, and more importantly, as long as you stay in your lane, that, that we can move no matter how fast we need to go with, with unbelievable proximity, without any fear whatsoever. And yet, the moment I begin to get in a place I should not be, or you begin to get in a place that you should not be, it, it all falls apart. Uh, last winter up in Auburn where I live, the uh, county repaved some of the roads up there, but then rain came in before they could get the lines down. So just, this is just the tiny road that leads into my neighborhood. So we're talking about two lanes and like a turn lane, but they couldn't paint the lines. And, and during those two weeks in which there were no lines, even though the speed limit was 25 miles an hour, that it was total chaos. Nobody knew where to go at any moment or any time. All these people were in the wrong place. At least I always thought they were in the wrong place. It seemed like there were a lot of people in the wrong place. And it's all because we did not have this clarity of where we were supposed to be. What's mine? What's theirs? What's God's? Those are, those are three lanes of life. There are three lanes, and there are more lanes, I'm sure, but those are three basic lanes of life that, that God has given us that, that whenever we are navigating them in the proper way, whenever we understand what, I actually, what is actually mine and distinguish that from what is actually yours and, and distinguish that from what is actually God's, our, our life can move with tremendous speed, with great proximity. Relationships can function the way that they're actually supposed to function. Anxiety tends to be low. Efficiency tends to be high, and yet the moment I begin to swerve in a place I should not be, it breaks down. If you're taking notes underneath that first column, what's mine, I want you to write the word control. I need to control what's mine. Control. Under what's theirs, I want you to write the word influence. Just mentally see it, influence. We need to influence what belongs to other people. And then under what's God's, I want you to write the word accept. Accept. Control, influence, accept. Control, influence, accept. I call that the CIA. Control, influence, and accept. You need to know the CIA because the CIA knows you. The writer of Proverbs here in verse number 26, he says, give careful thought to the paths for your feet. And be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. What he's telling his son is, look, there's a human propensity. There's a human tendency uh, to drift. 
that, that we lose intention and we lose attention. And whenever we do so, we tend to wander wherever it is that we want to go. As a matter of fact, some translations that say verse number 26, ponder the path of your feet. And that contrast in chapter four uh, with the father telling, the, warning the son in chapter five uh, about an adulterous woman, about a woman. And it says that, that the problem with her is she wanders wherever she wants to go. And so, so you have this contrast in chapter four and chapter five in which the father, father's saying, there's a difference between the those who ponder the path of their feet, who those that use intention about where they're going, where they're standing and where they're being, that to the extent that you use godly intention about where you are, life will flourish. But if you just wander wherever your eyes or your stomachs or other things lead you, life will fall apart. And the great danger for us is I think we often begin to drift into places that we should not be. And to the extent that we control what's mine, influence what's theirs, and accept what's God's, generally speaking, we can love well, relationships can flourish, anxiety can diminish, life moves. But if there's any area in your life today in which you feel stuck, just kind of in a rut, I can almost guarantee that there's probably something in your life that you have the right to control that you're not controlling. Or there's something that God is calling you to accept that you're not accepting. If there's some kind of anxiety welling within you, uh, apart from a medical condition, so often that is the byproduct of you and I trying to control things that do not belong to us. We're, We're trying to figure out how to ensure that tomorrow is exactly the way we want tomorrow to be when in reality, tomorrow belongs to God and not to us. God has given us today, he's yet to give us tomorrow. If there's some kind of friction in a relationship, I can almost assure you that one or both of you are either failing to control what's yours or you're attempting to control that which is not yours. And the byproduct of that is friction. What's mine, what's theirs, what's God? Control what's mine, influence what's theirs, accept what's God's. To the extent that you and I can stay in our lanes, life moves, anxiety wanes, and love continues to grow. Let's look at these three columns. All right, what's mine? All right, what is it that we actually do control? I think the amazing thing for me, and I'm a firm believer in the sovereignty of God and theologically, I'm way out there on the sovereignty of God, believing in it very strongly. But what amazes me is not that we have a sovereign God who controls all things. What amazes me is that sovereign God has willfully chosen to empower me with some responsibility over my own life. I'm not convinced that was a wise choice. I don't always do so well with that. And yet a day is going to come in which I'm going to stand before this holy and just God and I'm going to have to give an account of how I led, how I stewarded over uh, the life that God has actually given to me. I am responsible for many things. Dan Siegel down at UCLA, a psychiatrist, says that, that there are three basic psychological needs of humanity, that we need a sense of agency, we need a sense of control over our own lives, we need bonding, we need relationships with other people, and then we need some semblance of clarity or certainty, some understanding Understanding of what the future might hold. And what Siegel says is, whenever we don't have one of those things, it expresses itself in very specific ways. When you and I don't have some sense of predictability about tomorrow, some clarity or certainty about tomorrow, the byproduct of that is fear. We become afraid. When we don't have bonding, when we don't have connections with other people, it tends to express itself as sadness or shame. And so if your child comes home from school tomorrow sad, chances are there's, there's something that's happened in some relationship at school. That was, maybe a teacher said something, maybe they got a bad grade that they think the teacher's gonna like them now. Maybe they got made fun of on the playground or weren't chosen on the playground. Sadness now is a sign that the bonding isn't happening. And when you and I don't have a sense of agency, control uh, over some of the things that we're experiencing in life, it tends to express itself as anger. And so if you ever feel frustrated or angry and you're not sure where it's coming from, you can ask yourself the question, what in my life do I feel out of control of? That's probably the source of that anger. That, that's why many times people can have a hidden addiction and nobody knows they have the addiction 
Uh, but there is this, this unexplained anger. There's this rage that comes out and nobody can understand why. And the reason why is in that addiction, they are losing control of an aspect of their life that they're actually supposed to control. And because they're losing control, it expresses itself as anger. That anger often expresses itself in, in, in a different area or different place, but it's the lack of agency that's leading to the anger. We need a sense of control over our own lives and God has empowered that to us. But so often what we do is we fail to take control of the very thing that God has given us control of and and we actually outsource it to other people. So what is it that you control? What are the things that God's going to hold you accountable for? Well, your life, your your attitude, your energy, your, your effort, your character, the things that you allow in to, to shape who you actually are, your, your own sense of encouragement, your own sense of hope, those are the things that all belong to you. One of the aspects of maturing into adulthood is to begin to, to recognize that, that nobody else is in charge of my heart. I'm in charge of my own heart. Uh, my sense of vitality, my sense of life, the gratitude I have for the world in which God ha- has placed me, the excitement I have over, over his call and his mission within this world, my own spiritual growth. Uh, Paul's gonna say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling that we are called to now partner with the Holy Spirit now the transformation of our own souls. And so it's only my choice and my choice alone of whether or not I take in the word of God on a regular basis. If I'm in the midst of healthy relationships, if I'm growing spiritually to understand better who he is and what's going on, Am I allowing the spirit to work within me to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Is that taking place in my life? And if it's not, the only person responsible for that is me. Nobody else. So you hear all the time, well, I don't like that church. I'm not getting fed there. It's not their job to feed you. You got Jesus, what more do you want? Find a church to serve. Get to work, be about other people. It's not just about you. And yet what we tend to do is take these very things that we're called to control and we tend to ignore them because we're so fixated on all these things that are outside of our control. We ignore the very things that we are called to control. Let me give you a very simple test. You control the level of hope and encouragement you have today. That's your responsibility, nobody else's. So let, let, let's, let's assume you're a follower of Jesus Christ. I recognize not everybody in the room is. You love to have you. If you're not, just think about these things. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then, then you believe that God is the hope of the world. We live in a fallen, sin-filled world. God sent his own son now to rescue us. He's opened my eyes to his grace. He's now implanted his Holy Spirit within me. It is now my job to make much of Jesus, hoping that other people come to understand uh, the same love that God has actually given to me. And as he pours his love through me to other people, hopefully their eternities and their present days, realities will be changed as well, right? That's what it means to be a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Let me ask you this. How excited were you to wake up today knowing that you have the opportunity to shine the light of the gospel in California? Did you wake up today hope-filled and excited about this state that God loves or pessimistic and discouraged? My guess is If you have taken control over your own hope and encouragement, that means you are being diligent now to get God's perspective on your reality. And God's perspective on your reality would always lead to a sense of an excitement to share the gospel specifically in a place that on occasion may not know it. But when you and I outsource that, we tend to end up discouraged. So three years ago, we're moving to California and uh, had a church member there. So at the time I had an eighth grader and a 10th grader. There is no better time to move (laughs) if you want your children to hate you than when they're in eighth grade and 10th grade. So pastor at a church for 19 years, lead pastor for 13 years. It just needed a little break from the lead pastor for a little bit. And, uh, uh, Move in California, come to Bayside, be a teaching pastor, rotate around, have some fun, not get all the hate mail. That's what I was looking for. And so um, it's been great. It's been great. I messed something up. I'm like, hey, that's ray.johnson at bayside online.com. 
You go right at, you can, you can email him too. Ray.Johnson at basedonline.com. Anything you don't like, just send it to him. Um, so a church member comes up to me and I have a good relationship with him. I know him and he says, I cannot believe you're moving these kids to California. And I said, Bob, Bob, I've known you for a long time. You're a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. You believe that Jesus is the only hope of the world. Am I right? He goes, yes. I said, I also know you. You also believe that California is the most God forsaken place of all time. Is that right? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, Bob, why aren't you moving to California? If, if, we're, if we believe the gospel, if we believe that, that I was the worst sinner, the amazing thing about the gospel is that he saved me. Why did he save me? Because if he saves me, then you can think you can be saved too. If that's how good the grace of God is, that God can save Kevin, well, maybe I've got a chance as well. And we have the opportunity to wake up every single day in this land that may not know Jesus, in this place that sometimes they go in the exact opposite of Jesus. And we have the opportunity to share the love and grace, to literally love our enemies in a way that can make them pause on occasion and go, what is up with them? But so often what we do is instead of loving the very people that Jesus loves, we hate them, we disrespect them, we make fun of them, we're pessimistic about them, and we wonder why people don't understand the gospel. And y'all are like, bring Jason Kane back. Like he was so much better last week than this. <laughs> but why is that? It's because you and I do not control our own hearts and encouragement. We have outsourced that to this. And we get our perspective on our reality from our favorite news channels from a few companies that are a couple, are a couple hundred miles away from here who are spending billions of dollars a year to figure out how to get our attention so that they can sell to us and actually sell us. And their algorithms have taught them that the way to keep our attention is not to keep us at peace, but to keep us agitated. And they are more desirous of making money off of us than actually telling us the truth. And when you and I outsource our sense of hope to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, the byproduct of that is gonna be discouragement, pessimism, and dissension. So are you controlling what actually belongs to you or have you outsourced it? Control what's mine control the thing that God actually is gonna hold me responsible for. What's mine, we wanna control. Well, what's theirs, we wanna influence. And so notice what happens here. Now we have multiple lanes. It begins to show us that not everything is the same, that in one area where God is gonna hold me fully responsible and accountable for the decisions I make, in another area, I am not responsible for the choices or the decisions that, that other people make. I have to navigate this lane differently than I have to navigate this lane. In, in the same way that, that if you get into a turn lane and, and now there are dashes and, and yellow lines, you have to make decisions and, and determinations. You can't go until it's the right time to go. Whereas in this other lane, you can go as much as you want to go. We don't operate in the same lanes in the exact same way. What belongs to other people is not something that we get to control, but no, it is something we get to influence. But we can't influence what's theirs until we stop trying to control what's theirs. So, so what is theirs? Well, basically everything I put in the what's mine column when it comes to other people is in the what's theirs column. You get to make your own choices, your own decisions. You're in charge of your own inputs, your energy, your effort, your, your output, all those kind of things. You, you're, you, I don't even control what you think about me. I don't even control that. You get, to, you get to make up whatever opinion you wanna make up. That belongs to you, that doesn't even belong to me. But here's what tends to happen is we get so fixated. It is the human tendency to get so fixated on what belongs to other people and get so worried about that not going the way we want it to go that we begin to live in denial of those things that we actually do control. John 21, don't forget Peter has denied Jesus three times and all those kind of things. So then, but then Jesus dies, the resurrection happens. Now we have all the good news of the story, but Peter's probably still wondering, am I in or am I out? Like I failed him pretty bad. Does the cross cover that? And even if the cross does cover that, do I still get to be a part of, of this mission? 
And so the disciples are out fishing one day and, and suddenly Jesus appears on the shore and, and the disciples recognize him. Peter jumps in and actually swims to the shore, silly Peter. And the rest of the disciples have to, you know, row their boat ashore, hallelujah. And um, so they get to the shore, Jesus is cooking breakfast. They have a great time now. And at some point, Jesus takes Peter for a walk down the beach. And that's when he asked him three times, you know, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, feed my sheep. And so there's a restoration process that Jesus is helping Peter go through. And at the end of that, Jesus tells Peter, hey, Pete, whenever you were young, you went wherever you wanted to go, but now that you're old, somebody else will lead you. And the text says that Jesus told Peter that to tell him how he would die. So picture that. Jesus is prophesying Peter's future to him. What's the very next thing Peter said? Peter, seeing John in the distance, goes, yeah, but what about him? That's human nature. Even as Jesus is talking to us, we're wanting to control what he's doing with other people. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus says, Peter, what I do with him is none of your business. You follow me. What God does with your ex is none of your business. You follow him. But what God does with that coworker who cheated and lied and got the promotion that you deserve is none of your business. You follow him. But what God does with with, with your governor, with our governor, with our elected officials is none of our business. We, We follow him. You follow Jesus that we can't get so fixated on what everybody else is doing that, that we lose control over the one thing that we actually do control. It is our responsibility to obey Jesus no matter what anybody else is doing around us. We tell our kids all the time, hey, just because they do it doesn't mean you have to do it. Be careful about who you hang around. We try to tell them, take responsibility for your own lives and we now need to take our own advice. Matthew chapter 19, rich man comes to Jesus, said, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, follow the 10 commandments. The man arrogantly goes, I've already done that. Jesus, I think, internally laughs. The text says, now Jesus, knowing his heart, what his actual idol was, says, hey, sell everything you own and give it to the poor. The man, saddened by by that expectation, walks away to an eternity without Jesus. You know what Jesus did? Let him walk. Jesus so respected this man's ability to make his own choices, his God-given ability to make his own choices, that Jesus allowed him to walk into an eternity without him, knowing the consequences of that, because he would rather respect and value the ability of this man to make his own choice than to manipulate or control this man. And yet, you know what I would have done? Hey, hang on now. Wow, that was metaphor. Sell everything you own and give it to the poor. That was metaphor, hyperbole, don't worry about it. What if you you just gave 10%? What about a one-time gift to our building fund? What about about something, a tip of some sort? You you see, I would have tried to to manipulate the man into the decision that I think was best for him. And in so doing, I actually would have stripped him of his God-given humanity to make his own choices. When you and I attempt to control something that does not belong to us, we are not only stripping other people of the value of who God has created them to be, we are actually telling God, you got this one wrong, I'll take care of it. Family comes to me a couple summers ago, great family, great family. College kids are all home from college midway through the summer. Things are just, they're not going great. Things are fine, no big problems, but there's just a little bit of friction. They wanted to talk through it. This is not how they want to be. I sit down with the family. It makes total sense what's going on. They sent these kids off to college. They have come back now uh, kind of like mid-sized adults. And now they're trying to act like adults and the parents are still trying to be adults. And it's just a struggle. It makes total sense. Every family will go through it. But as we're sitting there talking, I just ask for what's an example of some of the tension that's here. And the mom says, well, you know, my, my middle son was dating this girl I didn't like. I get it. That's gonna happen. Boys are gonna sometimes date girls the mom doesn't like. I said, okay, so you just, you felt that, right? You didn't say that, right? She goes, no, I told him. <laughs> okay. 
I said, okay, no, that's great. That's beautiful. I'm glad that you told him. I'm so honored. I just love a relationship where a 25-year-old son is willing to come to his mom and say, what's your opinion about my girlfriend? And then you said you didn't like her. I would have been a little bit more careful with those words. Uh, but I'm, I'm just grateful that he asked. Oh, he didn't ask. So you just volunteered. Yeah, I just I didn't, didn't want him to make a mistake here. I, I said, here's a problem. He's 25, you're still treating him like he's 15. It's not your business. You don't get to choose who he marries. You don't get to choose who he dates. Now, if he's 15, you have, you have some, some controls there. Our, our, our family table at home, I have two kids. Our family table at home has six chairs. I tell them on occasion, look, y'all get to choose eventually who sits in these other two chairs. And, and as, as long as they are not a threat to our physical and emotional safety. We will love whoever you put in these chairs. It's your job to pick. Now, I, if my 16-year-old son were here, he would also tell you that the statement he hears the absolute most from me is, hey, Silas, be careful who you marry. They're the most likely person to kill you. And so, <laughs> I, I just state truth. But here's what happens when, when your parent still treats you the same way at 25 as whenever you're 15, you know what happens? You begin to pull away from them. And the irony is this, as you pull away from them, they actually begin to lose influence over you. Notice this. When you and I try to control something that is not theirs, that is not ours, we not only lose control, we also lose influence. But have you ever had a boss who just believed in you? who just empowered you, who hired you to do a job and you come to them with a question and they're like, hey, I'll give you an answer, but you don't have to come to me. I hired you for a reason. Go do that job. Have you ever noticed whenever you have somebody that respects you, that respects your boundaries, that respects who you are as an individual, as a person, you actually begin to seek them out for advice. You actually want to begin to know their opinion, to understand what's the right way because they have so entrusted you that that bonds them to you to where they actually have more influence over you now than if they wouldn't do that at all. When you and I stay in our lane, it actually empowers us to influence people that otherwise when we're trying to control them, we will neither have control nor influence. Control what's mine, influence what's theirs. And, and then we gotta accept what's God's. There's some stuff that's just God's stuff. It doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to you. He is sovereignly in control. We don't control the global economy. We don't control a pandemic. We don't control the, the very genetics that, that we have been dealt. We don't, we don't control the diseases that we experience, our own IQ, those, those kind of things. We don't control those things. And so when God makes a decision, or, or at minimum, when God allows something into our lives, whether we like it or not, we have to learn to live with open hands and, and to accept it. And yet so often what we tend to do whenever it comes to God is with these things that I don't control, you don't control, we tend to live in either denial or, or despair. And we try to fight in some way to get things changed. And whenever that happens, we just, we just kind of get stuck. And so I can, meet, I can meet two widows, do the funerals of their husbands, lovely marriages, lovely families, Great grief and rightly so. 15 years can pass and I can reconnect with them. And you connect with one and the tears begin to fall and we recount the, the husband's name and all the memories. And, but but, there, but there's, there's still a sense of joy even in the midst of the sorrow. And, and she begins to tell me about her life since then. And sometimes it's a, another marriage and sometimes it's not, but it's the grandkids and these kids and this job and all those kind of things. And, and, and the grief is still real, but, but she's in a different spot today than she was 15 years ago. And then you meet the second widow and it's been 15 years and it feels like it was yesterday. And... And no judgment, but it just feels like her life stopped the moment that happened. And, and for whatever reason, she just was ne never able to open her hands and say, okay, God, how, how can I live this new chapter of life? And when you and I fail to accept the choices of God, the byproduct tends to be a stuckness 
Remember the old show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? I can't recommend it to you, I'm a pastor, but it's hilarious. Um, so it's, it's a show on improv. So you can think about improv, what that means is, I, if I called you up right now, you and I could actually improv a scene. We could, we could improv a three to five minute scene with no preparation, with no practice whatsoever, taking on whatever the crowd recommends for whatever's gonna set up the scene. We could do that as long as you and I followed one rule. Improv is built on one basic rule. It's called the rule of acceptance. And what that means is if I introduce something into a scene or you introduce something into the scene, the other has to accept it and then build on it. So, so we just accept it and then say, okay, now where can we go with that? So imagine you and I are acting out a scene, right? And I suddenly pull a gun, right? That's the most Arkansas illustration of all time, isn't it? <laughs> That's, I gotta find a better illustration. So I pull a gun. In that moment, you can't go, whoa, whoa, no, we're in California. You can't make that joke. The moment you do that, all the action stops. The fourth wall is broken, it stops. But if you will accept what I've done and then find a way to build on it, you can interpret it however you want to, but you just gotta build on it. You can say, Kevin, why are you pretending to have a gun with your finger? Kevin, why do you have a water gun? Kevin, why do you have a gun that's not loaded? Kevin, why is your bullet in your pocket? Hey, look, Kevin, I'm like the matrix. I can dodge every bullet. I can use every 90s illustration I want to to interpret this. Uh, but the point of the matter is I have to accept it and build on it. And as long as I do, the action continues. Notice it's not the rule of agreement. I don't have to go, oh, I agree with what you've done. Now I can build on it. No, no, no. It's the rule of acceptance. There are some choices that God makes and you and I don't get a say. We don't have to agree, but we have to accept. And to the extent that we accept the diagnosis, the relationship that we've always wanted that just so far hadn't come our way, the relationship we always wanted that ended not of our own doing, the change in job, the change in the climate, the change in life, as long as we can, doesn't mean we have to like it, but as long as we can accept it and then lean into it and say, okay, God, what's next? Life continues to move. So I have a 19-year-old daughter, 16-year-old son, 19-year-old daughter. She has Down syndrome. It's a little different scenario than what many people think. We're actually leaving this afternoon to take her to orientation at college at UC Davis. She'll be gone for a week come back for a couple of weeks and then September 15th, she'll go there full time. Kind of unusual, have a child with Down syndrome going to a college, but they have, three years ago, they started a program for those with intellectual disabilities, leaning toward those with Down syndrome. You see, whenever you have a child born with Down syndrome, you know what the first 18 years are going to entail. It's, it's gonna be public school, but you have no idea what comes next. And so as Ella got into junior high, we're like, we don't know, what, what are we gonna do? She's very bright, she can have a job, no doubt. She's gonna need some help. And then, then she begins to get into high school. We're like, oh, it's right on us. What are we gonna do? And then, and then God led us to California. And, and we get here and as we begin to look what's next, we, we find out that within an hour, there's this program that can empower her. God, God takes care of us. That's why I moved to California, Bob. <laughs> Not my job to take care of my kids. God will take care of my kids. But 19 years ago when Ella was born, we, we didn't know before delivery that she had Down syndrome. Full day of labor. About five o'clock, Ella's finally born. We bring all the family in. There's all this celebrating. About nine o'clock at night, people are just kind of beginning to go their separate ways. And my pediatrician walks in. And whenever I say my pediatrician, I literally mean my pediatrician. The guy who was my pediatrician growing up He's also my neighbor. It's Arkansas. He was my mechanic. <laughs> Sell tickets at the ball game. Whenever he walked in at nine o'clock at night, my first thought was, oh yeah, he, he wanted to come tonight because he's gonna play golf in the morning. And the way, reason I knew that is because I played golf with him most Saturday mornings. Picked up Ella, began to congratulate us, tell us everything that was good. And, but I could just feel it. As a pastor, I'd been in that room too many times. I'm like, there's bad news coming. Just get to it. So we finally begin to say, I notice how her eyes are set a little different. Her ears a little bit lower than what you would expect. And her nose is just absolutely perfect. Look at this crease in her hand. See this extra space between her big toe and her next toe? Let me show you the sole of her foot. 
said, these are all classic signs of Down syndrome. He said, I'm 100% confident that Ella has Down syndrome. And then he began to tell us about how we lived in a different day and a different time, so many opportunities. You never, you never know what God's gonna do. All the good stuff. He answered every question that we had. And then he said, hey, I'll, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Call me. And then he left. And, and back then, at that time, labor and delivery, the nurses would come in and at night they would actually take your baby to the nursery so they could take care of them because they're getting paid to do so and you could sleep. They don't do that anymore, but that's y'all's problem. So as they take Ella away, now it's just me and Jenny for the first time in, in a long time, all after this full day, our lives changed, first child. And I walk over to Jenny and her first words to me after getting this life-changing diagnosis was, well, this is a road we never would have chosen to go down, but I bet you we never regret going down it. Open hands. Okay, God. I trust you. Now, now, that doesn't just come in the moment. That, that came from a, a life of faithfulness from my wife, who, who at a young age had her eyes opened by God's grace and the reality of what Jesus had accomplished for her on the cross and committed her life to that and then had tried to walk with him every single way and, and seen his faithfulness time and time again and in situations where she didn't understand what God was doing, where life took a turn and, and in faith now following him empowered her to face the, the greatest challenge of her life. And in that moment, not to fight, not to argue, not to doubt, but with open hands say, okay, God, in the same way your open hands accept accepted me at the cross. My open hands now accept what you have dealt to me in this moment. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to build on it and I'm going to make much of you. I wonder today, do you have closed fists about anything in your life? Is there anything outside of your control, outside of your influence, a, a, a diagnosis, a, a test, a, a situation that you can't seem to, to get right, a broken relationship that you've done everything that, that you can, the, the state of the global economy, the world affairs, the political situation. Is there anything in life that you're shaking your fist to God, trying to beg him to change things? And is it possible that what needs to happen at this moment is for you to stop gripping this life in this world and to open your hands in acceptance and say, okay, God, I'm in. Because I can assure you of this. It is a much better way to live. And when your hands are open, life continues to move and you continue to see God in ways you never would otherwise. Control what's mine, influence what's theirs, accept what's God's. If you do that, if we do that, we truly can worry less, love more, and get things done. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for these new friends, for their willingness to be here today, to consider you, what you've done for us. Father, empower us, even as we reflect on your cross uh, through this communion time, empower us to be reminded of who you are, get our perspective of our lives from you and your action, and to walk out of this place a different people, salt and light to a community that desperately needs it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.